Surprise, surprise. This is Detective Tracy, uh, Wayne County Sheriff's Office, and uh, present in the room is Detective Welch, and did you say your name? Elizabeth Dow. What's your full name? Elizabeth Diane Dow. What's your date of birth? August 7th, 1955. And what's your address? 1352 Q Street in Springfield. Okay. Telephone number? 726-9667. The date today is uh, May the 21st. The time is approximately 14.04 hours. And this conversation has to do with case 83-3268. Um, okay, we don't have to be quite so formal now. I just want that <laughs> okay. introduction, man. You go by Diane. Diane. Yeah. You said you have an aversion to take the quarters anyhow, yes, right? Yes, I do. Okay. Well, the reason we're taking this is because when we took the original notes um, in the emergency room there, I don't know that I got everything that you had to say, because you do talk quickly and have a lot to say, and it makes it much easier to do it this way. And Diane, for the purpose of the tape recorder, Diane's in a hospital bed, room 319, has a fractured shattered, shattered. radius. Is it the radius? The radius uh, and oh. muscle damage. Didn't didn't affect the owner? The, big the radius is the big one. Oh. We were wrong. Oh, really? Yeah. Was, uh, I did too. Oh. But, um, okay, the left arm. Um, I don't know. If you, are you ready to go through, try to recall all these events again? Sure. Okay. Why don't you take it from the top? I guess we could start back on uh, the 19th. That's Is Thursday. that Thursday? Okay. Right. The, the, when, when you got up and go that. From the beginning of the from day? From the beginning of the day. Oh, okay. I got up at 515. Took a shower, fixed my face, got the kids up at a quarter to six, and they got ready and went to Grandma's house at 6.15. Um, okay, I just want to make sure it's going. Okay. I went to Grandma's house at 6.15. I'd leave the kids there so I can go to work. I leave at 6.30 to get to work by 7. And the kids have breakfast there, and the girls walk to school, and she watches Danny all day. And I left at 6.30, went to work. Um, I had a cake that day. I'd made a bun cake the night before for the guys at work, and I cut a piece for the kids and my parents and left it there that morning. And I got the cake to work, and one of the guys said, well, it looks like the piranhas already got to it. And they were referring to my kids, and I <laughs> said, yeah. And uh, so I did my work that day, did my job. We had the cake at break and all that. And I got off at 3.30, not quite 3.30, I got off a little bit earlier, but I hung around and talked to the guys for a while. And then I left the office at 3.30 and got to my parents' house and sat around and talked to my mom for a while. We got company here. More flowers. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll take the card, you can set them over there. Thank you very much. So, um, I, got, I got to my parents' house, and I think we sat around and talked to my mom for a while, and Sherry went out and cut me a couple roses, and she cut one for Christy, too. 
and then we left. We didn't have supper with my parents that night. We went home because my mom and dad were going someplace, I think, some kind of meeting. So we went home, and Cheryl went over, and that day she had asked. I'd finally consented to let her keeping a cat, which she wanted to get from the neighbor lady. And so she went over and got the cat, and the lady brought over the litter, the litter box and all that stuff, and told me what she ate and all that good stuff. And then we did all that, and um, I talked to a girlfriend from back home, told her about all the stuff we've been doing, how we usually go to Hendricks Park, or the river at least every day, and that we were going out to see a girlfriend. Well, that day I had found a newspaper clipping, well, a couple days earlier I found a newspaper clipping in the paper about um, this adopt-a-horse thing, so you could adopt horses, and it was going to be Saturday and Sunday, so I wanted to get it out to her before then, because she wanted to adopt a horse. And pour it out and see if you need it? Sure. I was just going to wait, but yeah, just, yeah. Oh, how nice. From Bill and Van King. He was one of my supervisors. So, that's pretty nice. Mm -hmm. So, okay, then, um, so I took the newspaper clipping and the kids were out playing. And uh, I finished talking on the phone finished cleaning the house and doing the dishes and all that stuff and we took off about 9 o'clock or 9.15 or something like that. I don't know what time it was. It was still light. And we went out there. She lives out in Marcola on Sunderman Road. And we went out there. And I knocked on the door and told her about the clipping and she says, oh, well, have I got a surprise for you. Come on out. So we went out there. She already had a horse. <laughs> She'd just gotten it a couple days earlier. Same day I found the newspaper article, as a matter of fact. And so she went ahead and took the thing, the paper, I guess. They considered still adopting a horse, but anyway, she took it. But we stayed and the kids fed the horse grass and pet the horse and stuff like that. And then we left. And we went back out Sunderman Road. And like I said, we like to just cruise around and see stuff. We're new to the area and the kids love the scenery. And the trees and they like to watch the rapids in the water at the river and stuff like that. We just liked enjoying stuff like that. So we just went out cruising around and we drove around and I ended up going down this other road, this off road, which is called um, Old Mohawk, Old Mohawk Road or something like that. So I just took off down there and got down a little ways and there was a guy standing in the road right waving his arm. He was not like on the white line, but he was in the center of my line. So I stopped and got out and asked him what was the problem. And because it looked, you know, it looked like he needed something. He was frantic. And so he came over to where I was and he said, I want your car. And I said, you got to be kidding. I mean, how many people really do that in real life? They don't. And he pushed me back and he fired into the car so many times. It was, God, it was horrible. And my little girl raised up in the back seat. She's the only one that raised up. And she Which just, one is that? That's Chrissy. She's the one that's still here. And uh, she raised up and she had such a look of terror or confusion or something. I don't know. There was just a look I'll never forget that I can't describe. And then she fell back on the seat and she grabbed at her chest. And it was just so that, um, and then he turned to me and he goes, I want your car. And I was just aghast. I didn't know, I mean, I had to do something. So I faked throwing the keys to distract him because I, he was a little bit bigger than me, not a whole lot, but a little bit. And I knew I couldn't beat him up in a fist fight and he had a gun anyway. And I just, I figured if I could distract him, if I could just draw his attention away, I could shove him and get the hell out of there. Sorry about my language. That's all right. <laughs> That's all right. And so I kicked him with my knee sort of and shoved him. And well, as he was swinging around, when, he, when I threw the keys, he swung around and he shot a couple times. And one of them caught me in the arm. And it didn't even hurt. It felt like somebody had squeezed me. And that's all. It didn't even hurt. But I knew I'd probably been hit. At least physically I was hit. Whether he hit me with a bullet or hit me with a gun, I was hit somehow. And I shoved him, and I jumped in the car, and we took off. I put the key in the ignition and took off. And if he fired after me, I have no idea, because Chrissy was laying in the back seat, just choking on her own blood. 
And I kept telling her to roll over on her stomach so that she wouldn't, she was drowning. She was just drowning at it. God. Cheryl was on the floor not making a movement or a sound, and Danny was in the back seat just crying so soft. She said, Mom, so soft. And I, God, I just kept telling her, I kept saying how much I loved him. I told him, don't worry, we'll get away. I said, we got hurt, but we're going to be okay. I kept telling Chrissy to roll over on her stomach and I was driving as fast as I could. And Danny kept moaning and I couldn't stop. If I had stopped to roll Christy over on her stomach, she would have just in a panic rolled back and I'd have lost five seconds. And five seconds is a lot and I couldn't stop. But God damn it. So I just kept going. And we got out to the end of the road and got out on the, the Mohawk. That, that bridge out there on Mark the road. Yeah. Mark we got Cole. out on Marcola Road, the bridge that goes over the Mackenzie, and Christy stopped choking. And I knew that that meant she, her lungs weren't working anymore. She wasn't breathing. She just, I just kept saying, God, do what's best. You know, if they got to die, let them die, but don't let them suffer. And I kept driving, kept driving. We got to the hospital. My arm was so started sort of starting to hurt a little bit, and I grabbed a towel and wrapped it around. I don't know, I don't know what, the towel was maybe beside me, I don't know what it was exactly. We had been to the beach the weekend before, and it was a beach towel. It was the only one that got left in the car. Kate, when did you wrap that towel around? When I, when I was driving, because it was starting to drop. How far down the road? I don't know. I, mean, I don't know. Down, down the bridge? It may have been at the bridge where I had to stop for a stop sign. I, I don't recall, honestly, I don't know. You didn't stop before then? No, I didn't. I just kept going until I got to the end of the road. I didn't stop at all. You Which is ridiculous because he was on foot and he couldn't catch us, but I just didn't stop. But I had to stop because there were cars coming and I didn't want them to hit us. That's all we needed was that a car wreck and Chrissy's already suffocating there. So, so, so really... At some, time, at some point I grabbed the towel and wrapped it around the home. But what I mean is that that's about the only stop you had to make. Or did you have to stop yeah, the signal? I had to, yeah, I had to stop the two stoplights. I mean... Did you go on the freeway yeah, down, down no, the road? Or, or no, out Marcola Road? Marcola Road. Just follow, yeah. Follow the Marcola right. Road out to the Mohawk. Did you and already, There was a stoplight there, but it was green, so we went on through it. And then we had to stop at one stoplight on the way here. So maybe it didn't take us that long to get here. It just seemed like it took forever because she wasn't breathing anymore. It just seemed like it took forever. Mm -hmm. So maybe it didn't take that long. But anyway, so I got to the hospital. I laid on the horn. Cause I, I wanted to grab my kids up and run in, but I couldn't. My arm was starting to hurt. So I laid on the horn. Some lady came out very big and flustered having somebody doing such a thing in hospitals. And I told her to get the hell in there and get somebody out here to get my kids and call the cops. And she says, she just looked at me. And so I started to go in the hospital. I picked my arm up. It was hanging. I picked it up. I went in the hospital and I said, somebody go out there and get my kids out of the car. They've been shot. And they did. They went out. And I went back out there. And they missed Cheryl. She was on the floorboard. And I said, there's another one on the front floorboard. She's under a sweater. And so somebody, the nurse or somebody, went out and picked her up. She was the one that died. And uh, I went back in. And I don't think they even knew that my arm was hurt. So it was all wrapped up. I was holding it. And they probably just thought I was holding myself. You know, in pain. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I told the lady, call the cops right away, and she, she called a couple other people first, but I kept sitting there saying, call them, call them. So finally she did, and she reported that there were three children that were shot, and then I finally told her, and I've been shot too, and she said, oh, okay. And so uh, they took the kids in, and I went into the, the emergency room where they were working on them. Christy was just so... Christy and Cheryl both, they were yellow. You know, have you seen a dead person? Oh, well, lots of them. That's what I figured you probably had. Lots. But they looked dead. I saw a man a few months ago that hung himself. It was a neighbor. And he hung himself because of money problems or something. And I could see he was dead. And his wife just kept saying, John, you can't be dead. And she kept trying to revive him. And I, I didn't have the heart to say, hey, Mary, he's dead. But I could see he was dead. His eyes and his color. And he was his tongue was all swollen. He was dead. And that's just how Chris and Cheryl were. Just dead. I was devastated. I, uh, it made me just sick. And Danny just kept crying, and I knew that was hope. I knew as long as he kept making his hand, he was okay. 
But when, when he was in the car, as soon as we got to the hospital, I laid on the horn and I got out. And I could see he was shot right to the middle of the back. And I just knew he'd been hit in the spine, but they said his legs were so he wasn't paralyzed. And I was just so afraid of that. So anyway, in the emergency room, they were taking care of the kids, and they were take, taking care of me pretty much, but I was mostly just answering questions, telling me everybody. I don't even remember everybody's name, but everybody that was asking anything, I was trying to give an answer to. And then uh, they wanted me to go back out to the scene and try to point out exactly where we were. And uh, so I said, yeah, fine. And they said, we want you to know that it's dangerous if you go out. You know, something could happen, you know, with my arm, because my arm hadn't been attended to at all. Mm -hmm. And I said, let's just go. I want, you know, the sooner I show you where it's at, the sooner I can get fixed and better I'll feel. The longer we wait, the further away it's going to get. So, uh, I knew they were doing the best they could for my kids. They told me that Sherry was in bad shape and probably might not make it. And I said, okay. So then they wrapped my arm up with something. Oh, they put it on a metal splint thing, wrapped it up with gauze. And I went out with the officer, somebody, a detective. I don't know who it was. I went with somebody and my dad. And I went out and showed them as close as I could to where we stopped. I also alerted them to the fact that there was a yellow car in the road because I had to go around it. It wasn't really off the road in the dirt. It was sort of half on, half off. And I said, wait a minute, there was a car back there. And he said, where? And I said, right back there. It was an old yellow kind of car, a small, a medium-sized car. It's not like not like the car that we were driving in, which to me seemed big. But it was bigger than my car. Have you see my car? It's a little new yes. car. Okay. Bigger than that, but it was smaller than this. So it's a medium-sized car. And it was yellow, a icky old yellow car. And it was an older car. And it had been there, and it wasn't there now. And so I told him that. And I said, now, I don't know if it's his car. It could just be maybe some kids were parking there. Maybe they were necking. Who knows? You say a thick old car is like it's oxidized, or is it a pale yellow? Like a pale yellow. Okay. Was it a ratty looking car? Or, you know what we call ratty cars? I mean, beat up. Like dented. And dented and, and not well taken care of. It was not well taken care of, but it wasn't really done to that either from what I could see. I didn't notice it. I mean, who really looks at a car on the road? It, just, it was just an older looking car. It didn't look like it had been any major wreck or anything. If it had it had a, 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 a plate from out of state on it, do you think you would no, have? No, I wouldn't have noticed it because I'm from out of state. And oh. For all I know, everything is from out of state up here. All the Oregon plates still look strange to me. I still have Arizona plates on my car. Sure. So it's, <laughs> it's not strange for me to see us. And where I come from, everybody does. You know, it's on a snowbird. So I would not have noticed the plate. So my dad asked me the same thing. He asked if there was a, a different state. Like, there's a lot of Washington plates down here. And I, I just don't recall. I didn't look. And so, anyway, I said, well, the car was right back there. I told him as close as I could to where I thought the car was parked. And there was a house out there, and it was right past the house, just before the trees. That's where the car was. And as we got past that, just a little ways, when it started curving like that, that's where the guy was. And I don't know if he was walking away or walking to me, because when I got there, he was already standing in the road flagging with his hand. And so I don't know which way he was walking at all. And uh, so I told him all that, and then... What, would you describe him again? Yeah. Okay, he's about 5'9", and I assume that because my ex-husband is about 5'8 or 5'9", and he's just about that height. I'm real bad with heights and measurements, I want you to know that. Okay. <laughs> but he's about 5'9", he was medium build, but pushing towards being a little bit heavy. So we assume probably 150 to 170, because my ex-husband is about 145, and he was heavier than Steve. Um, he had darkish hair, but not black. It was like a brown, a dark brown, whatever. His face was kind of stubbly, um, not yeah. like a beard. Not like he had a beard, but like he hadn't shaved in a couple of days or so. Um, his, um, his hair was kind of shaggy looking, like it had been cut in a shag, but not brushed out properly. Um, his voice was, it wasn't high, it wasn't low, it was just a voice, just a, no accents, no lisps. Um, Nothing that would distinguish him outwardly from anybody else. 
He was wearing a t-shirt that was a light color, but it wasn't pure white. It wasn't something that would glow in the dark type. So I don't know if it was dirty or if it was a pastel or what, like maybe a beige, I don't know. And he had Levi jacket on and pair of blue jeans. Was, were those the old faded out type or were they newer looking? No, they were just older. Not, I think, did you see the Levi's I was wearing? Yes. They had holes on them and stuff. I mean, I like old comfortable. They weren't quite that comfortable. They, were, they weren't holy or anything like that, but they were not real brand new. Either. Medium blue then. Yeah. Right now bright, you know how they are when they're yeah. brand new. Yeah, no, they weren't outside. brand new. Okay, let's see what else. Um, that describes him pretty well. Okay, so back to the scene. I showed them where everything was. And the guy that I was with, we drove to a couple of houses and looked around. My dad noticed we drove up in, in one yard. And my dad is a pretty observant person. He tries to watch everything. And when we drove up in somebody's yard, there was a light on upstairs. And when we pulled up in the yard, it went off. And my dad mentioned it. Oh, no, the policeman mentioned this. Wasn't there a light on up there before? And my dad said, yeah, there was. So my dad kept watching the window where the policeman was, or the detective, whoever he was, was talking on his little phone. And I was sitting there just watching everything. And the reason we were there is because there were horses out in the field. And I never thought of this, but he says, um, I asked him how many dogs were going to be out looking because I only saw one dog, and I just didn't think a dog could sniff very far, <laughs> one dog. And he says, well, there's horses here. And I says, don't tell me a horse can sniff out a person. <laughs> he goes, no, but a horse, if he tried to sneak through the field, a horse would be spooked, whereas maybe we couldn't see him, the horse would sense him, which made a lot of sense. So that's why we were there, to see if the horses were spooking, which they weren't. And so um, my dad said, hey, that light's back on. And I looked up there, and it was. And I just said, that's it. I ducked down in the seat. I said, one shot's enough. I'm not being anybody's spare target anymore. <laughs> so I slunched down in the seat, and the light went off again. And we left. I, I, to me, that's kind of crazy. I would have, if I was a policeman, I think I would have at least knocked on the door, because he lived out there, and those were his friends anyway. I would have knocked and said, at least, are you guys? I mean, sure, husbands and wives turn the lights on an awful lot. I used to. You got <laughs> after you finish fooling around or whatever, you get cleaned up. So maybe that was it. But I don't think anybody feels like a fool knocking on the door if there's something serious. Happening. But he did. He said he'd come back for you and check it out. So maybe he did that. He probably did. I think he maybe wanted to get, he wanted get you back to the yeah. hospital. He did because that's we were on our way and then he wanted to stop and see the horses. Because I told him, hey, I've told you all I can out here, and my arm is really starting to hurt. And so. Yeah, he took me up to the Bob, to 322, Bob. This is my time. <laughs> so he took me up to where you were, up by the bridge. And uh, then I went with you, and then he went back. So maybe at that time he did check it out. I'm sure he must have, because he lives in that near area, he said, and that's, mm -hmm. those were his neighbors, and so I'm sure he probably did. But then I went back to the hospital, and I tried to sneak in and see my kids, and they stopped me. So, yeah. You Thank you, yes, Thank you very much. And so uh, I had to sit down. They came and told me that, uh huh, no bad habits like that. Huh? You smoke it, don't you go. <laughs> <laughs> they came. And after this, everything happened so fast and so many things. Um, well, we sat down and had a lot of questions to ask you, for okay. sure. Oh, yeah. We talked, but we went down and took x rays, and we were talking there also. Mm -hmm. They did some tests on me. Then we went, after x-rays, we went back to an examination room. They wanted to see if I'd been hit anyplace else. And um, while we were in there, they told me that Christy had died. And then I was really confused because the way they had described it before, I knew how my kids were on the tables. Christy was here, Danny was here, and Cheryl was here. And they said the little girl on this table, Cheryl's table, was not making it. And so when they told me that Christy had died, I was crushed, because as I said, Christy's my favorite, but I was confused, too, because Chris, Christy wasn't the one they said wasn't making it, but I sort of accepted it because Christy was the one that quit choking in the car. She was the one that was suffocating, and I could believe that she was dead. I, I just, I was, I kept saying, I want to see him, I want to see him, because I wanted to see who the hell was dead. Who was it? You want to know who to mourn for, who you're supposed to cry for. 
and they kept saying, it was Christy. And I said, okay, I'll distraught. And then somebody else came in, a doctor, somebody came in and said, Cheryl, no, the preacher, pastor or whatever, the chaplain, chaplain, came in and said that Cheryl had passed on. And I'm going, who is it? You know, and he says, well, your father identified it as Cheryl. So then I knew that, because I said, that does it. You take me, I want to see who is alive. I don't want to see who's dead. I want to see who's alive. And he says, well, your father's already identified the dead girl as Cheryl. So then I knew that my dad knows my kids. And I figured, okay, now I know who it really was. And I can believe it, because Cheryl didn't make a sound or a the whole time we were driving. So they said that she was dead when she got there, and they just never could bring her back. So um, that's why they said she wasn't going to make it, because they couldn't bring her back at all. Which, it, I know she didn't suffer at least, and that's good, because now it's the rest of us. You know, we're going on, and I've got to go home and tell Chris and Sherrod, and Chris and Danny, that Cheryl's not here. And uh, Chris, my God, I don't know how long she's going to be here. She looks so bad. But they say she's going to be okay. And they say that... I was talking to my brother. He works in a hospital. And his girlfriend is a, a recovery nurse or something like that. I don't know. She does something. And so she sees it all the time. And she says, if Christy's answering questions, whether they're conscious or subconscious, if she's aware of enough that she's shaking her head or her head yes or no, then she's okay. Her mind is okay, which is great. Yeah, because she's so <coughs> smart. She's almost a genius. She's just super, super smart. And it would just be devastating to think that she wouldn't be that way again. But anyway, so I did. The first time I finally knew for a fact that it was really Cheryl that was gone was last night, what night did I come here? Thursday. Wednesday morning, whenever they finally brought me to my room, they had they had told me before they took me to my room that I could see the kids, and I may have keep that from Friday. Yeah, early Friday, about four o'clock or something. And I got to see Chrissy, and I knew for sure that it was Sherry that was gone. And uh, my parents, I think my parents came in to see me. I don't remember when it was, but my mom was asking me for Cheryl's favorite color. She's going to buy a dress. We're going to have a small service for her. And she wanted to buy Cheryl a new dress. Cheryl loved new dresses. And so I told her that I've been thinking I want it to be white. I mean, she's such a good kid. This should be white. She's an angel now. So. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> anyway, then after that, I've just been going through emotions every day. You talk to people, you talk to old friends, and it takes your mind off of everything. Okay. Let's go back to uh, the day this happened. Did, did you have anything to drink that day? No, uh, I alcohol? didn't. I like whiskey, but I haven't had any whiskey. And the last time I went to see Nick was a month ago, I think, almost a month ago. I don't know, it's in my diary somewhere, but it's at least three weeks ago. And I got real drunk that time. I spent the evening at my acceptance house and I don't get along, so I had a lot to drink. Well, how long ago was that? About three weeks ago. Three weeks ago. And that was you in Arizona. Back to Arizona. Yeah, I was okay. in Arizona when I did that. But, but, but that I came day back, no, I haven't had anything to drink in three weeks. Were you on any kind of drugs or medication no. or anything like that at the no. time? Okay. I have smoked pot a few times in my life, but it's also been quite a while since I've done that. But lately, the kids and I have been so into doing things that I haven't... The reason that I drink and the reason that I on occasion smoke is when I feel lonely and, and depressed. And I guess that's the case with most, most people, but that's why I would do it. And so I never really drank when the kids were around at all. I, it was like on Friday night when Mom would take the kids and I'd be alone in the house sitting and thinking and wondering why the hell Nick isn't here or whatever, you know, because he had promised we were going to be mates and we were going to raise the kids and everything was going to be just fine. And I couldn't understand why all that was different. And that's when I would drink, it's like Friday nights when the kids were going on. Because I'm, I'm a real conscientious mother and I despise people that are lax in raising their kids, that can allow themselves to get drunk when their kids are around. Because you can't tell when an emergency is going to arise and the kid will need care. And you aren't able to do it. That's to me. That's very 
premature, so I didn't do that around my kids. So, uh, like I said, the kids and I for the past few weeks have just been hanging out and doing stuff together, and I haven't had a time to really do it or even want to do it. I got to the point that even in my book, I told Nick, I think I love the kids even more than you. And what about that area out there? How many times have you driven I've out? never, I've never been, been out there. there. I've been out to Marcola once. I went to Heather's house once, no, twice. Once I went out there with her and my dad the first day that I got to Oregon to take her home and it was at night and I didn't know the area and I didn't, I didn't even know where we were. The second time I went was about three weeks ago. I drove straight out there and talked to Heather. She didn't have a phone, and I talked to her about coming into work, and then I came back. And, um, so that was the third trip you So that was the third trip, yeah. And that, we took it, excuse me, a different way. We took the back way this time. What, so, how do you describe the back way? Uh, Sunderman Road goes like this. It and goes, I can never remember the name Sunderman until I see it. It goes off at the bridge there and, and, and it curves, it back, curves back around on yeah. the main highway. And right. How, how did you go in? Okay, the first time I went all the way up Marcola just before the bridge. Okay. And then you turn and the name is Sunderman. And I can ne like I said, I can never remember the name until I see it on the post and then I know that that's the turning post. Well, when we were coming up, I knew that we were kind of close. But it was starting to get kind of dusky out, and so I wasn't real sure of the, the trees and the, the sites, you know, the, the land areas. So I wasn't positive where to turn, and I, I knew there was supposed to be a bridge, but I wasn't sure where. And then all of a sudden I saw the word Sunderman, I said, well, that's it. So I turned, and I'm going, you guys, this isn't the wrong. <laughs> and they're going, well, let's turn around and go back. And they're always full of tell. And I said, no, I know Slenderman is the name. And so we just kept going and going. And I realized we finally got to Heather's house, and I said, that was the back road. It takes a lot longer, but but that was the back way. It seemed longer, maybe, because we didn't know where we were going. So is that Heather Clurry? Yeah. 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 She's a real sweet kid. She came in to see me yesterday. She went to work, and she just said, guys, I can't do it. Because we, we started there at the same time. She tried to get on at my dad's post office and work, but Eugene hired her first. And She's real sweet. We got kind of close because we started the same day, two subs in a new city, and so. When did you start there? Uh, I started in Eugene about seven or eight weeks ago, and then um, an opening came up in Cottage Grove, which is a real small town, and you get a lot more experience. You get to cover a lot more area, clerk work, carrier work, and 204B work, which is a supervisor.